In 2000, we bought an abandoned 100-acre farm in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. We spent years cleaning it up, built a new house, and now are trying to make it a functional homestead farm. Welcome to Red Tool House. Hello, everybody. Today, I want to go through a comprehensive uh, discussion about artificial insemination, uh, why we do it, how we do it, the processes. A lot of people ask us, you know, why do you use AI? Why don't you just keep a bore uh, on farm to take care of that? It, it seems like it would be automatic. You wouldn't have to mess with anything. And that is a good point. Uh, having a bore allows the bore to take care of the breeding. You don't have to be involved in that. And that does make that process simple. Um, the reason why we didn't go that direction is uh, there's multiple reasons. A, uh, a bore is another mouth to feed as he gets to age to uh, to be developed and mature to be able to breed and then of course he's eating a lot of food so you know that cat's on the on the farm eating feed constantly so he's he's another mouth to feed um, he's also a very uh, usually a very ill-tempered mouth to feed uh, you think of a boar as they get older they get to, you know, their tusks developed so you either have to have the pole have their tusks pulled or you're going to deal with that uh, in, in interaction. Obviously, when a pig's in heat, he gets pretty fired up too, so uh, a little bit of danger elements there. Um, and also, you know, I only need a boar once a year uh, per sow. So uh, a pig cycle is every 21 days when they're not nursing uh, and when they're not pregnant, of course. So every 21 days, I'd have to worry about that boar wanting to gain access to that sow and breed her. and, and I want to have complete control of my breeding process. I want to schedule exactly when uh, I'm breeding and, and determine when I'm going to have piglets on the ground versus uh, a boar breaking out of a fence and, and breeding and then me being in a situation that gets me off schedule. So that's why we, we looked at all the pros and cons there and thought, hey, let's try AI, uh, a, a boar that shows up in a bottle and I only need him once a year. Seems like a lot less maintenance. Now I do have to get my hands dirty. Uh, but that seems to be a lot less maintenance than, than having a boar on, on farm, and it seems to be safer for us. Well, what we have in this video is, is um, I'm going to have some discussion here in this setting, but uh, uh, over the past year or two, actually, I've collected a lot of video of different times of, of doing AI, attempting AI. There'll be some video clips I'll share with you that uh, are, are uh, ex explaining the process, uh, showing the equipment, uh, actually showing the process, and then there's some other video clips of me failing at trying to do the process. So we'll we'll go through those. You may see you know, the backgrounds are different, hair length's different, pigs are different, all those type of things. Uh, but hopefully we can kind of thread this needle and, and have a comprehensive video here of, of what we do and how we do it. Well, the actual process of inseminating, the, the actual day of insemination, isn't that difficult. It's It's fairly simple, and if you know anything about AI of other farm animals, it's, it's very complicated. Temperature you have to maintain. You've got X amount of time once you receive the, the semen to, to, get it, uh, uh, to get it inserted, all those type of things. With, with a sow, you, you've got a lot more leeway there. So the, the thing that I found is, is more difficult is just a matter of time management. I'm not the best time manager in the world. I can't uh, stay as organized as I should. So the first step that I recommend when you're considering doing AI with, with pigs is get your schedule figured out. First, you need to determine the day that you want to have piglets on the ground. The, the day of farrowing is what it's called. When a pig gives birth, that's, that's called farrowing. So you want to figure out that day of farrowing. And that, of course, is based upon your calendar schedule. Do you want uh, the first of the year, like January 1, so you can sell your piglets for 4-H market and those type of things, because that's what they look for as, as early birth to January as possible? You say, well, I want it to be first of spring because I don't have to worry about super cold temperatures if you're in a climate such as ours. You say, well, I want it to be later in the summer because I want my pigs to be ready uh, for Christmas, uh, selling Christmas hams. So there's all kinds of things. So I would first look at that schedule and say, okay, when do I want these piglets on the ground? And then you can just go through the calendar and back up. Uh, the gestation period of a pig is 115 days, or as, as the older generation would say, it's three months, three weeks, and three days. Pretty easy to remember there. So you can kind of go on the calendar and say, well, if I want piglets on the ground April 1st, let's just back up and I'll figure out uh, when I need to breed. Now, of course, you can't nail that down specifically to the day because of the heat cycle of a pig. A sow goes into heat every 21 days, and that's what you need to determine is that heat cycle. And uh, what we normally do as we get closer to our breeding day, uh, several months out, 
I'll start noticing the, the heat cycle of the cell. So I'll say, okay, that, that cell is showing signs of heat on this day. So I'll go ahead and mark the calendar. 21 days from now, she should so, show signs again. And then I can start to figure out, am I going to breathe that month or am I going to breathe the next month, the next 21 days? So figure that out, put that on a calendar. So how do you determine the, the heat cycle? How do you determine uh, when, a, when a sow is in heat? Well, it's fairly simple. Uh, a sow goes into heat, she has physical signs. She'll have swelling uh, in her reproductive areas there. She'll have discharge. Uh, believe it or not, her mood changes quite a bit. She, she gets a little irritable. And uh, then one of the funniest things is, is, is standing heat, which is just a, a they become a statue, basically. It's, it's quite funny. Uh, my boys think it's hilarious because when they go to stand, uh, they can sit on them and, and you know, ride them like a, like a horse, you know, flop their ears around, all that kind of stuff, because they literally become statues. And that allows, you know, in nature, that would allow the boar to be able to mount the sow, take care of business, and, and not have to be in a hurry. Um, it's, it's actually not a speedy process when it's done naturally. So standing heat allows you to see the obvious. Now, if, if, that, if you go to throw your leg over a pig or you put weight on the back of that sow and she doesn't stand, she's going to book it, and you're going to end up in the mud or you're going to end up on your face, which I can tell you happens from personal experience. So that's a good way to test standing heat. Just kind of put pressure on the back. If the pig arches its, its back, and then it starts to lock up, you'll, uh, you'll know that she's in standing heat. And of course, look at the ear position. I can, uh, now with the experience, I can walk through the pasture and I can just look at the ears of my pigs and say, okay, that one's, that one's getting ready to go into standing heat. Her ears are swept back a little bit more. She almost looks like she's more alert. You know, kind of this expression, you know, ears kind of pinned back a little bit. So that's another example you can look for. Well, another so sign of determining whether your sow's in heat or not is when you have creepy stalker pig, like this one. So no matter where I go, that sow was following me around. That's Merida, and she's ready to go. So she's following me everywhere. In fact, she's actually missing breakfast. Everyone's up on the hill eating, and she's right here beside me. So you determine your standing heat and say, okay, she is standing on this day, and mark that, mark that on your calendar, and then you can count exactly 21 days and say, on this day, she should go into her standing heat again. And I've had what, six different breeders now, and every single one of them has shown that characteristic. Uh, I've never seen any of them off. There's not a 20-day or 22-day. It's, it's pretty much dead on 21 in my experience. Once you've got your heat cycle figured out, it's now time to source your semen. Where are you going to get uh, your supply from? Uh, we don't have any local suppliers here in West Virginia, so of course I uh, went to the internet to see what I could find. Um, careful with your keyword searches there. When you're looking for a semen supply, you may uh, get some results you don't want, so definitely uh, choose keywords wisely there. So uh, we found this place in Ohio, which is a neighboring state of ours. Highly recommend them if it makes sense geographically to have them shipped to you. Uh, Shipley Swine Genetics, I'll put their information in the show notes and probably display it here somewhere. Uh, but Shipley was, uh, was a good, uh, good farm to talk to. And this is one of my recommendations. If you're going to get your source, uh, don't just rely on their, their marketing stuff. Don't just rely on their website. Talk to them. Uh, I called Shipley Swine Genetics and, and the gentleman spoke with me. Uh, he probably talked for an hour answering questions that I'm sure he, he probably has answered 5,000 times, um, if, even some dumb questions. You know, he, first thing he asked me, he said, well, what are you looking for? And I said, well, I'm, I'm looking for semen. I, I, I don't know really where to go from there. Uh, I don't necessarily want my pigs to be able to go to college and uh, you know, get a good ACT scores. I just want them to produce uh, good breeders, good meat pigs. One thing he does is, is sends a catalog, and I recommend getting that. You know, it's, it's always a benefit to have some hard copy to go through, get a better understanding uh, of, of what is available. And a funny story, I, I ordered the catalog, and I thought, how's this going to show up in the mail? And, and what's my mail carrier going to think? They already think I'm weird enough with some of the mail that I get. But uh, is there going to be a big catalog that says pig semen across the front of it and a big centerfold of a boar or something? So I wasn't quite sure what to expect there. But Shipley's even discreetly packages their semen catalogs in a manila envelope. So it's, uh, it's something you don't have to answer questions or don't have to worry about your mail carrier looking at you funny. So got the catalog in, uh, looked through the processes, um, doses, depending on the breed stock, uh, the quality of the boar, could go up to $350 a dose. So this could get really expensive quickly. Well, one recommendation is when you talk to your supplier, ask them about overruns or extras or leftovers, whatever they call it. And that's what was really neat about Shipley's. He recommended that to me. I had no idea there was such a thing. It makes sense when you think about it. 
But when they go through their collection, they collect on Monday and Thursdays each week. When they go through their collections, if they don't have all that product sold, it obviously goes in the garbage can. It's not like you can put it on the shelf and hold it for forever. So he recommended, he said, well, if you're not wanting to choose a specific breed or a specific boar, you can still choose the breed, but if you're not wanting that specific boar in the catalog and you're willing to take whatever leftovers I have from this breed line. So, for example, I chose Duroc based on his recommendations. So he, had a, he has this group of Duroc boars that he collects from. He said, if you don't mind just whatever I've got left over from whoever in my Duroc catalog, that's what I'll send you. Well, that dropped the dose price down to $35 a dose. Now, that's a big change. That really saves some money. And again, it's still coming from a quality boar. You just don't get to choose who is, is the donor. So the next thing to consider uh, as you've chosen your supplier is, of course, time. This is, this is where time management issues come in again. So you know the heat cycle of your, your sow now. You know, okay, well, I've got a breeder on this date. So what about shipping? Are you a one-day ship? Are you overnight? Most of them are overnight because they want that product to stay as viable as possible. <clears throat> the viability of this semen is about 10 days, which is extremely beneficial. So you can use that to your advantage. Figure out when your heat cycle is, talk to your provider when he collects, and figure out your shipping time. Okay, so after you've chosen your provider, your, your source, and you know your sow's heat cycle date, then you, you're ready to, to get down to work. So when the day comes to order, and you call your supplier and say, okay, I, I want a dose, ship it to me the next day, he's gonna ask you for uh, if you want other supplies. So what do you need to do AI with a, with a pig? Well, of course you need your semen. No brainer there. They take care of the package on that. You don't have to worry about repackaging. It comes in, in little vials that are uh, little squeeze tubes. It looks like little ketchup bottles. Uh, very easy to use. Another key tool is your catheter. Here's one now. Catheter is, is very key, uh, very inexpensive. I think a pack of, um, I call them rods, I believe. I think a pack of five rods is um, a couple bucks, four or five bucks. So they can throw that in the pack as well. That's kind of why that one has a bend in it. They fold it up and put it in the box. So catheter, you want to kind of keep them clean, of course. It makes sense if you're shoving anything inside a pig, you want to try to keep it as clean as possible. Just common sense there. So you just get the catheter, and uh, we'll get into details of how that works. The third product you may uh, require is lubrication. Um, believe it or not, uh, we don't need that. For some reason, my pigs are okay. <laughs> There's all kinds of comments and jokes I'm sure you people are making right now, but so be it. <clears throat> Um, what's funny is the, the first uh, breeding cycle we tried, our first try, I obviously wanted to have supplies around, so I thought I'd try to be cheap because the lubrication from the, the uh, provider was a little bit more expensive. I'm like, well, shoot, you can just go to the, the, the grocery store or to Rite Aid and get what you need there without any trouble. So I uh, sent my wife down to the local Walmart, and she buys uh, copious amounts of, uh, of personal lubricant. And just happens to run into a friend from high school. Oh, she's got a shopping cart full of lubricant. It was kind of, kind of humorous. I wish I'd have been there. She was mortified and, and swore she'd never do that again. <clears throat> so put that on your optional list of lubrication. Now you can get it from your provider, and again, be shipped in a discreet package so that it keeps you from having to answer questions at church on Sunday morning. Okay, so now the day has arrived when you're you're ready to breed. You've got your catheters. You've got your semen supply. You've got your lubrication if you need it. <clears throat> you know when your heat cycle stand is. For dosing, uh, the actual dosing is very simple. Again, as we talked about with standing heat, that pig goes into full stand. So you can throw your leg over that. So this is where help would be, would be nice. Uh, it's not critical. But if you had uh, somebody else that wouldn't mind throwing their leg or putting the weight on the pig, you want to you put that weight in the, in the middle of the back. Um, I think I have one video clip of a, of a sow that was really large, 600 pounder, and I'm trying to breed her, and she's so big that I'm sitting more on her back hips instead of her back, so it doesn't get her to lock up as, as much as I'd like. Uh, so you can kind of see she's actually walking around with me on her back. It was kind of humorous. So once you get the pig to stand, again, if you need lubrication, it's when you apply it to your catheter. Now the catheter is actually threaded, and I'll show an example there. Uh, the catheter is threaded, believe it or not, because the cervix of a sow is threaded as well. If you're doing the process like I am, where you're, you're straddling, then you actually want to insert the catheter through the vagina and actually come up a certain direction, because if, if you come straight in, you're actually going to go into the bladder. You want to kind of come on an upward direction. So if you're straddling, you want to be coming back toward yourself. 
and what I normally do is, is I'm just kind of twisting that catheter as I go along. Again, since it's threaded, it, it just helps. And, but when you reach access to that cervix and that pig is in standing heat, she'll actually accept that. So as you thread that in there, her cervix will, will those threads will gear, those will mesh up, and that, that catheter will get locked right into place. And you'll know it's, it's just like working a wood screw. When it hits the rock bottom, it, it's, it's in there. And you, you couldn't even pull that out without unthreading it. So once you've reached that point, you know you're threaded in, and you know, that's depending on the size of your cell, that, that catheter could go in pretty far where maybe you only have that much to work with. So once that's in, you know, take your dose, pop the lid off of it, stick it on the end of the catheter, give it a squeeze. You don't want to force it too much. Uh, you want to just give it a little bit of pressure. And if the pig's very responsive, uh, her cervix will actually contract and will actually start to draw that in on its own. So you'll, you'll definitely feel it. You know, if, you, if you feel a lot of resistance and maybe just twist that uh, catheter a little bit, get a little bit of uh, uh, clockwise motion there to, to free it up and just give it, give it a couple more squeezes. But once you feel that break loose, then it's, it's, it should be pretty easy at that point. And that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, squeeze the whole bag in when you go to remove the catheter, unthread it. Obviously, you're going to have a little bit of wasted product that, that's going to come out of the, the catheter and obviously come out of the, the pig's vagina. Not a big deal. You, uh, as long as you don't lose that whole dose on the ground, that, that's critical. That process is pretty simple there. So once you've got that first dose in, just look at the clock and say, okay, 12 hours, I'm going to do it again. Just keep doing that while she's standing. If you've ordered three doses, try to get three doses in it. Um, again, it's, it's rare for mine to go 36 hours. So if I had three doses, I'd maybe go... First one, 12 hours, and maybe six hours later, but I was afraid of missing that, uh, that heat cycle. So you've determined that the uh, heat cycle is, uh, is not showing back up again. Uh, you've had a successful breeding, so we got to set the due date now. Well, again, if you remember, as I mentioned earlier, that the uh, gestation period is 115 days, or three months, three weeks, and three days. So go back to your dosing day. Uh, that day that you actually got the doses in, and that's when you start the clock. Uh, there's actually some pretty helpful uh, uh, free calculators on the internet. Just search pig gestation calculator, and, and you'll get some options come up, and you put the breed date on it, and it'll tell you exactly when that due date is. Now, that due date is, is pretty close. Um, one of my sows, you, you, could, you could set your watch by it. She, she always hits right on that 115th day. I've got one that's actually due soon. She's due June 1st. And last year when I bred her, she uh, actually fared three days early. And I'm hoping that's not the case because uh, I'm actually going to be out of town um, prior to that. So we're hoping that's not the case in that situation. So uh, you can set that on the calendar. Know that that's uh, going to be the, the time that your, uh, your sow should be ready to farrow. And then just, just sit back and watch. Just, just you know, make sure she's taking care of herself. Make sure she's got a good access to water. Um, one key thing that I've learned is the weight on your sow. You may think, um, you know, like um, if, you, if your spouse uh, wanted to eat everything in the house when she was pregnant, that you may think that's a good idea. Let my, let my sow eat as much as she can. The more she eats, the better it's going to be for her. And uh, you know, that, that weight is good. It's actually not necessarily the case. A pig can put on a lot of fat, uh, but it also puts on fat in the birth canal. So you can actually end up restricting that birth canal and having piglets be lodged in there. And man, you do not want to go down that path. You do not want to have to go uh, have a fairing where you've got to assist. We've been blessed in, in the three years we've done this. We haven't had to assist any at all. Uh, but again, there's farmers that I know of or have heard of their stories where they've had horrible experiences having to pull every single piglet out actually losing uh, sows because of uh, piglets being lodged. Uh, so that's one thing to take into consideration. That, that's not the only reason why you'd have to assist. There's plenty of other complications that could come into play. Uh, but just keep that in mind. You don't want a real hefty sow uh, because that birth canal is going to be restricted by all that fat buildup. Well, that's about it. That wraps up this episode on uh, pig insemination. We hope uh, you found it somewhat useful, somewhat slightly entertaining. You can see by some of our video footage that we've had successes, we've had failures. But just really enjoy uh, uh, the whole process. Once you get to the farrowing day, it's very exciting to see uh, see the uh, sow go into into labor and deliver. Again, there's complications, there's loss. You know, we had some loss last year. It's you know there's the, the positive side and the negative side, but it's really been enjoyable. And, and we hope that if you're going to try this, if you if you've got pigs and you've never 
uh, considered AI, and now you are that, uh, that you give it a shot. A again, the mechanics, the process isn't as difficult. It just takes good management and just figuring out your time in your, in your cycle. If you have any questions or anything that I didn't cover in this video about pig insemination and you would like to, uh, like to uh, ask us those questions, just visit our website. Uh, go to redtoolhouse.com, uh, use the contact link, and you'll see a form there. Just fill out the information, just put your question in there, and, and I'll answer it in a timely fashion. Um, if you have any other questions, you can post them on Facebook as well if you like. Go to facebook.com forward slash redtoolhouse. And be sure to sign up for our e-newsletter. We, uh, we send information out through there, uh, not only about our local supplies and deliveries, but just other things going on, blog entries, updated videos, that type of stuff. So just check us out, and uh, hope you have a good day. Take care.